Hey guys, welcome to Digital Srini channel on YouTube. And in this video, I am going to talk about how you can use Fast AI API to uh, perform lung cancer subclassification. This is basically a classification problem. I chose lung cancer subclassification because many of you asked me to cover lung cancer uh, classification as uh, part of my videos. And I normally do Keras based uh, API. So we use Keras which is uh, sitting on top of TensorFlow. In this video, I'm going to use Fast AI, which is very similar to Keras, except this uses uh, PyTorch in the backend. In fact, Fast AI, I think, is a bit more easy compared to Keras, and uh, we'll see that as we go through uh, as we go through this tutorial. I'll explain where I got the data set from, and if you really want to learn about Fast AI, you can look for resource resources online. And I have uh, gotten myself started off by just uh, reading this, you know, this this book that I talked about in one of my previous videos uh, when I did the review. But uh, anyway, so it's up to you how you get started, but. Uh, Look into this. Even if you come from a Keras background, maybe Fast AI is something that makes your life easy for your specific type of applications. Okay, now let's jump in and uh, get to work. Let me start by describing the data set. So we are going to use the lung data set of this uh, lung and colon cancer histopathological image data set. Uh, it's referred to as LC25000. It's 25,000 possibly because it's got 25,000 images. So we are going to use the lung part of this. And I did add description as part of the as part of my code that I'm going to share with you. This one has three classes. The lung data set has three subclasses. Lung underscore ACA that refers to lung adenocarcinoma and then SCC which refers to squamous cell carcinoma and then lung underscore L N, sorry, which is benign. So there are two types of uh, carcinomas right there, and then the benign ones. So 5,000, 5,000, and 5,000 images each. And if I open my uh, folder right here, I divided these images further into train, test, and validation. So if I open my train, you should see these three subdirectories, ACA, N, and SCC, and each of these contains images of size 768 by 768, and I have 3,750 of them as part of my train. And I believe as part of VAL, I have 750 images for each class and as part of uh, test, the remaining 500 right there. So I further divided these. And in the past, I talked in many of my videos on how to divide your data set into train, VAL, and uh, uh, test uh, using the split folders library. So let's not get into that discussion now. So, but this is the structure I have and I uploaded this to my Google Drive, exactly the same structure, except I added another directory to save any trained models. So this is the starting point. Now let's get to our fast AI. And uh, I, I mentioned this in one of my previous videos when I did the book review. Uh, fast AI API, let's get into that. Yeah, I have this uh, PDF file. I'll leave the link to this also as part of the description. But if you look at the API, there is a low level, there is a mid-level, high level, and application level API. It's very easy to interact with the application level API because you see they are clearly separated. You know The tools are separated into vision, text, tabular, and so on. We are going to focus on the vision because this is a vision type of task, image classification, and then look into the toolkit that is available as part of vision. So that is the plan. So let's jump into our fast AI classification. Uh, on Colab and make sure your runtime is GPU type. Okay, and we are connected. And I already connected my Google Drive right here. So I connected my Google Drive as you can see. Our test, train, val, and models. Okay, so now let's get started. The first part is just describing the data set. Now, here, uh, Google Colab already comes with, uh, you know, uh, Torch installed, but I'm rolling my PyTorch back to 1.4. I believe the latest one is 1.9 because there's nothing. You don't have to do that. But if you don't do that, whenever you're trying to read the images and uh, interact with the images, it uh, throws a message saying that the de default behavior 
uh, is blah 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 all of these and uh, that was annoying me so i just rolled back to torch 1.4 if you have better ways to handle this go ahead and find that but for now i'm rolling it back to torch 1.4 so just to confirm that let's go ahead and make sure that the version that i'm using is 1.4 which it is and now also make sure that it is actually interacting with the gpu that google is nice enough to provide to us for free so let's go ahead and run this torch.cuda get device name and this is giving me Tesla K80. Great, that's pretty good for me. And you can you can install, try to install FastAI again. It is already installed, so it probably comes up with requirement already satisfied, but if you want to install it, go ahead and do that. Okay, up to this point, it's just basic bookkeeping or basic uh, background stuff that we need to take care of. And from now on, let's focus a little bit on FastAI. So like I already mentioned, we are looking at fastai.vision part of it, right? So from the vision, import specific methods that are going to be useful for us. Which ones am I uh, getting here? Get transforms. This is, uh, this is basically, as you can see up here, uh, do you want to flip the image? Uh, flip horizontally, flip vertical, maximum rotation. So these are all the image augmentation type of tools. Yeah, so I would like to get that. Image data bunch is uh, another one that, and CNN Learner helps you uh, helps you uh, create your model and classification interpretation uh, again we'll get to that once you are done with your training you can actually use classification interpretation to uh, 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 we'll get we'll get to that I'm going to import this library for now and we'll uh, look at that towards the end of this video and of course models models contains uh, if you want to use VGG 16 if you want ResNet so whatever model you want to use as the backbone uh, for transfer learning so you can go ahead and check the models by importing this models library. And from the metrics, I'm using uh, uh, error rate and also accuracy here. Please go ahead and look at the documentation to get the full extensive list of everything that's part of, uh, part of these uh, libraries. Let's run these two lines. And now I'm defining my image directory. Where is my image directory? data underscore lung data set, right? This is my image directory. All I did is copy this path and then just provided that right here. So let's go ahead and run that. And now let's define our transformations. Remember, we are getting the transformations right there. Now let's go ahead and define that. So what transformations do I want for data augmentation for my data set? Uh, I'm just going to do flipping and also rotating maximum to about random rotation up to about 10 degrees. So these are the two operations I'm trying to do and let us define the transformations. Of course, we are going to provide this transformations as an input to our image data bunch that, uh, that uh, uh, helps us get the data ready to be supplied into our training model. Okay, so, so far, so good. Now let's move on to our image data bunch right there. And we are reading that from a folder, right? We have our folder ready with train, test, and validation. Of course, you just need train and validation um, just to. Uh, so we are getting those from our folder. So where is that folder located? That's my image directory, right? So that is the path. And what is my training uh, directory? It's called train. So this is basically the name of the directory that I have, which I believe I called it train, right? So train, and then the validation is VAL. So that's exactly what these two mean. And then what transformations do you want to do while reading the images? Well, all the transformations we just defined up here, flipping and maximum rotation of up to 10 degrees. And then while we are reading the images, let's go ahead and resize them to 224 because I'm going to use a pre-trained model with pre-trained weights that uh, uh, requires an input image of 224. If you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to use the pre-trained, if you want to put your own together, you can always do that. But this is a very good, uh, a very good starting point, I should say. And a batch size of 64, let's uh, 224 size images. So hopefully we can include 64 images per batch. Otherwise it'll throw an error saying out of memory, but it should work in our case. And number of workers equals to eight. This is the only one that's non-intuitive in this entire thing. So I thought of putting a note. Oh, I did put a note right there. How many sub processes to use for data loading? Yeah, otherwise you can overwhelm your, uh, you can overwhelm your memory. Uh, you can try number of workers equals to four if you want, or you can put zero, in which case it's using, I believe, the primary uh, the primary method. Uh, uh, let me not give you wrong information. Go ahead and look at the documentation from uh, for number of workers, what zero means, what four means, what eight means. But basically, it's how many sub-processes to use for loading your data. 
Okay, so, so far so good. Let's go ahead and run that line and that gets our data uh, ready. It may take a little while. Yeah, there you go, it's done. Now, let's go ahead and look at the data. It's very simple. Once you have this object, the data objects right there, created from your image data bunch. Now you can just go ahead and say show batch. That means it's going to show a batch of our images. So let's do that. It may take, it may take a while because it needs to load the 64 images, resize them into uh, 224 and uh, do some of these transformations. But that's not that bad. It's not that slow. You can see these are all the images with the labels. So to plot this, they made it, FastAI made it so easy, right? It's just your data dot show batch. Okay, let me kill that and move to the next level. How many classes and uh, count for each classes? How many images do I have for each class? So here you go. So we are looking at data.classes that gives you the names, ACA, N, and SEC. And how many do we have? Three of these classes. And what is the length of how many, I mean, basically how many for each uh, classes in train, sorry, how many in uh, images in train and how many images in validation? There you go, all of these right there. And there are many, many, many more things that you can do by uh, just playing with this object. But these are the key things that uh, at least I'm pretty sure most of you would like to uh, know before proceeding towards putting together a model. Okay, now let's go ahead and put together a model. Again, if I click on this link, let's see, it opens up uh, all these models. So what models, uh, which one? This is for CNN Learner. So if you go to CNN Learner, you can see exactly what you can define. There is like a lot that you can define, but the bare minimum is your data transformation right there and uh, a few others. Do you want to normalize? In fact, I should have said that uh, equals to true, but uh, I think the default equals to true. So when I come back here, first of all, let's go ahead and start this. And by the way, one of the things that you can do here is models. There is a loss function you can define. There is an optimizer function. There is a learning rate. Excuse me, one, two, 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 two. I'm trying to find the uh, models right there. You see, when I come down here in CNN Learner, I'm going to use models.resnet. Okay, uh, there are way too many things and I can't, uh, uh, I can't even find, uh, oh, model right there, models. Which, which model would you like to use? So uh, again, how do you know what models are available? You can actually use this command, directory, models, because they're all stored right there. So when you run that, you see there is a whole bunch. We are going to use ResNet 34 or ResNet 50, one of these. And you can see many of these that you probably recognize, VGG 16, VGG 19, exception, and so on. So these are all the available models for us uh, to start with. Again, this is for transfer learning, basically. Okay, now let's go ahead and define the model. Let me increase the zoom a little bit for those of you who struggle to see small screens. Okay, uh, so how do we define our model? Our model equals to, in Keras, we do sequential. You put something, you put something else, you add another layer if you want to do that from scratch or import your VGG, top equals to false, like you don't want your dense layers and so on. Here, uh, we do our model equals to, or in this case, learn or learner equals to, again, this is basically our model, CNN learner. Okay, remember, CNN learner is one of the things that we imported from fastai.vision, convolutional neural network learner, and within that, First of all, let's define the data. My data is right there. And this data contains both, oh, sorry. This data contains both my training information, validation information, so it knows everything about how many classes I have, what type of images I have, and all of that. That information is effectively used by CNN Learner to actually put together a, uh, to actually give us a uh, model where we don't even define like how many output neurons do we need to have. Well, we do, why do we need to define? We know how many classes we are trying to classify, so it should actually put it together in a nice way for us. So let's see if that works out. So this is my data, and the model structure I'm going to use is models.resnet34. We just saw models contains like a whole bunch of stuff, and we just want to use resnet34. And what metrics do we want to track? Accuracy. So let us go ahead and define our learner. And this will define, and let's summarize our learner. This is model.summary. So there you go, all of these. And uh, input image should be, let's go all the way. Input image, uh, 
Now it's not giving me the input shape, 112, 112. So input image, we know that is 224. And all the way, let's come down and oh, it's a pretty large. Okay, so there you go. So finally, you have three nodes as output. We never mentioned that we have three classes. Uh, up to now, it's like number of classes we never ever mentioned. It inferred that based on the number of folders it detected on, uh, you know, in our subdirectories, in our train directory and so on. So based on that, it said, okay, hey, you want three neurons for the output and that's what it actually added there. Okay, so that is, uh, go ahead and learn more about these. I'm just giving you a quick overview of how easy fast AI is in getting you started. Now, by default, all these layers are frozen except for the last layer, which is the classification layer, which is where you have these three uh, output neurons. So by default, when you try to train, it's actually training uh, the last layer and freezing everything. When we train the model, if you use uh, fit one cycle, it only trains this last layer. So if you want all the layers to be trainable, which takes a lot of time, obviously there are 21 million parameters. So it does take a lot of time to train, but for transfer learning, maybe you don't need to train all the layers. But in this case, let's say I want to train all the layers, then we need to unfreeze them. And you can unfreeze only a specific number of layers and all that, just very similar to Keras. But uh, let's unfreeze all layers right there. So when you do that, it unfreezes all the layers. Now, one key thing is when we define our model, we need to define the learning rate. Right. Typically, uh, uh, we set the learning rate to, I don't know, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So a small learning rate. Fast AI actually makes it possible for us to find what the best learning rate is. Yeah, it explores your, uh, it, it finds the optimal learning rates and it, we can plot it in a visual plot. So uh, you, this, takes, this takes a little while because it is actually experimenting with different learning rates. So it is doing this training on a smaller you know, set of images, but it, it, it can be slow. I have already did, done that. And now let's go ahead and plot. So how do you do that? Again, this learn is something, uh, is our model, right? And we unf have unfrozen the model. And then we are trying to find the learning rate. And then we are going to plot it, learn.recorder.plot. And suggestion equals to true means it's going to plot and it's going to put a red dot wherever it thinks is the best learning rate for us to start with. So let's go ahead and plot it. Oh no, object has no attribute. Oh, because we did the learn, I have to do learn.find. So I wanna show this to you. So let me go ahead and run this. This will take, I don't know, four to five minutes. So I may as well pause the video, come back and let's look at this because I really want to make sure you guys see this. Okay, so let me uh, pause the video, but you see you see the plan right there. You see it's going to uh, look at number of epochs, training loss, that's that's what we'll see at the end of this. But we'll, we'll go through this uh, after after this part is done. Okay, so it says LR finder is complete type this dot uh, plot. So that's exactly what we're trying to do down here. So learn dot recorder dot plot and suggestion equals to true puts the red dot. If not, it doesn't put the red dot. So let's go ahead and include that suggestion equals to true and let's go ahead and plot it. So this is the plot I'm talking about. As you see in the X axis, you have your learning rate. So it went learning rate from one E minus six, like very small learning rate to almost like uh, uh, one <laughs> learning rate right there. So it is suggesting, uh, if you look at the documentation, it says go ahead and pick something in the middle of this downward path. And if you pick something on the left hand side, then uh, it results in very slow training. Yeah, because the loss is not changing by much as you can see. And of course you don't want to be uh, doing it the same on this side. So you want to be somewhere in the middle. So I would pick something around one E minus four. Uh, it's almost suggesting that, right? So it's saying 10, um, 9.1 or 10 times 10 to the minus five. So uh, one E minus four. So I would just start with that one. What do I mean by start with that? So now let's go ahead and fit the model. So let's scroll down. Now, 
you can use a single learning and you can also use discriminative learning rates which means uh, you give a parameter maximum learning rate. So in this case, you see, if you give max LR, this is the parameter that you actually provide when you're doing this discriminative uh, learning rate while the training is happening. That means it maintains a low learning rate for the initial layers as they need lesser uh, tuning, but gradually increase the learning rate for the la later uh, layers. So. Uh, this is, this is what, and that's why I'm going from minus five to minus four, right? So here I'm going from minus five right there to about minus four. Maybe I can go from five minus four times 10 to the minus four to one E minus three in this range. It's, that's fine. We'll, uh, I have already tried this and how do you fit it? We are going to learn dot fit one cycle and uh, how many we are going to fit Two. When you do fit one cycle, again, we are training the entire model because we have unfrozen that. And we did that for two epochs with this learning rates, with this scheme for learning rate. And there you go. After the training, I got an accuracy of 98.7%. That's not bad. The first epoch took about seven and a half minutes. The second one, six and uh, almost seven minutes. But I got 98.7% accuracy. So at this point, you can go ahead and save the trained model. I'm going to leave this. I have already done that. And then you can load the trained model. So this is how you can work with uh, once you train the model, save it, and then come back later, go ahead and load the model. Okay, now let us go ahead and build a, remember I wanted to save this uh, for later, classification interpolation. That's a long thing to type. And I usually copy paste this because I made so many mistakes when I'm typing it. But what is it for? The classification interpretation object uh, is created from our learner. So it can show us where the model may, how the model is doing predictions. So this is in a way helps us study the model. Um, is it doing good? And you can extract confusion matrix, for example. You can use it to show where is it doing misclassification. So all that information is stored as part of this object called interp that I just created. And this is created using the classification interpretation from the learner, which learner? The learner that we just trained, learn. So that is what this part does. And once that's done, now we can go ahead and use it to extract insights. Okay, so now that we have the object, let's go ahead and first of all, extract uh, the top losses, which means, okay, plot the top n classes. I think this is cases, we'll see. I think this is top n cases or instances where the classifier has least precision. And uh, let's do nine, top nine. And uh, it plots it. Yeah, I think it is top nine instances, not classes. I'll uh, verify that and then share the code with you. Uh, so uh, what is it showing us? It is showing us the prediction, actual loss and probability. So if you look at this central image, it's probably easy for you guys to see. It is predicted this as a squamous carcinoma, but the actual label for this one is a benign and there you go, this is the loss and that's the probability, zero, probability is zero. So right there, these are all like misclassifications as you can see. It uh, looks like it's doing a misclassification even with 98% accuracy, right? 98.7% accuracy. The misclassification is between uh, SCC, benign. Oh, it's also ACA and benign. So these are all the misclassifications basically. Now you can understand, oh, there is something going on here, even though that's not a lot. We are only looking at misclassified ones. You see, we have 98.7% accuracy. This is the remaining 1.3% uh, or so. Okay, so let's close that. We need a bit more quantitative information. So let's go ahead and plot the confusion matrix. Again, it makes, FASTA makes this so much easier, right? All you need to do is your interpret object that we created dot plot confusion matrix. And that's it. Let's go ahead and plot it. And you can see, oh, that's not, that's not good. Maybe we need to retrain again. So this is pretty bad confusion matrix. So uh, then how come we are getting, how come we are getting pretty bad? good training. So I I think my learner, I haven't, I have to train it again. Sorry guys, uh, because we did all of these uh, loading of the uh, learner and everything. So obviously 
I haven't trained it. I was hoping not to train, not to touch anything, but I, in the excitement of showing you things, I reset my, uh, my classifier. It's good, it's good learning opportunity. Uh, obviously it's not going to extend the video a lot, but after seeing this, we know why it is doing this. Because when I trained it, I got 98.7 accuracy, but right now it will not be the case. So let me go ahead and train this for these two epochs. It's going to be unfortunately 13, 14 minutes that I have to wait, but you don't have to, I'll pause the video. Sorry again, I should have thought about it before touching the learners, but I was so excited about teaching you all the stuff. So let me pause this and I'll continue as soon as the training is done, okay? Okay, so there you go. After about 13 to 14 minutes, uh, the training is done. And again, we got 98.7% accuracy. While it, was, uh, while it was training, I thought of actually <laughs> uh, uh, loading the file. I mean, I have already saved it. I should have actually loaded it. But again, uh, there is some fun in uh, failing and then trying to make it right. So let's hope we made it right. So uh, the training just got finished, so we can uh, save the model. I'm not sure how the model is performing, so I don't want to save it yet. So let me skip and let's define our classification interpretation object again. Okay, and now let's go ahead and check this one more time. Again, whatever we did earlier was, I guess, a waste of time. I should have realized when we saw the probabilities to be zero, but that's okay. Now let's see what is happening. So prediction, actual loss, and probability. So long ACA is con uh, confused with SCC. This is uh, more of what I was expecting because previously, when obviously we didn't train the model, we just loaded the weights and then tried to uh, try to do this exercise, uh, you know, mistakenly. We saw that most of these ACA and SCCs were confused with uh, benign. So now it's basically the confusion between ACA and SCC. Yeah, the two times of carcinomas right there. This is more like it. And as you can see, these are the bottom ones. Again, uh, this time for real, we have 98.7% accuracy. So what you're seeing here is, is the remaining one. So let's uh, confirm that by looking at our confusion matrix. Remember, this is the confusion matrix we had the last time. And uh, ideally, you have high numbers along diagonals and possibly all zeros otherwise, right? So if it's a good model. So this sucked. <laughs> that's, that's good that we were looking at that. And now that we retrained it, let's hope for a much better, yeah, there you go absolutely much better. So uh, all the uh, benign ones, it's actually doing an amazing job. We have 750 images in each of these classes and all 750 benigns are uh, correctly classified as benign. And 15 of these are incorrectly classified right there in each of these classes. So this is a very nice, well-balanced uh, uh, confusion matrix, I should say. And now let's go down and just to view the list of classes most misclassified. What do we mean by that? So let's go ahead and run this so you can see it. So this is the actual classification. Uh, I mean, actual label. This is the predicted and how many times it happened. So lung ACA got mistakenly predicted as SCC. Lung SCC has mistakenly predicted as ACA 15 times, 15 images. That is evident from this image anyway, we know that. This is only like three classes where one class is perfectly classified. But if you have 10 different classes, you can see how this information can be much more useful. So there you go. This is our fast AI. And I should apologize for this little glitch where I got super excited about uh, showing you every little detail and accidentally overwritten our model. But I think that was a good exercise. Anyhow, how time from my side, hopefully not much time from your side. So I hope you found this tutorial to be useful. I hope you find uh, you find find FastAI to be a promising uh, a tool in case you are already working on Keras, maybe uh, find reasons to switch if you want to. I mean, I love Keras. I'll keep continuing uh, using Keras because I'm very much comfortable with that. But if you're getting into a new field like uh, natural language processing or something else, I definitely recommend you to explore what's out there as part of fast AI. Maybe tomorrow when you join a new job, when you start a new job, and that's where everyone else is using on this and they expect you to learn, know some of these. This gives you a good good starting point anyhow. Yeah. So uh, thank you guys. If you really happen to like this video, go ahead and hit like. And if you want more on this topic of fast AI, let me see if I can learn uh, myself and then teach you guys if you if you like to listen from me. Okay, thank you and let's meet again in the next video.